I think somebody at uh, Stanford said faculty uh, today, uh, they don't need to be the sage on the stage. They need to be the guide on the side. Hello, listener, and welcome to another edition of Tech Innovation Talks. For those of you joining us for the first time, a bit about our show, the concept, produce concise, on-point conversations with specialist tech and innovation guests. And this week's chosen subject, we're taking you back to the classroom as we look to cover the topic of innovation in education. And joining us today to explore this vitally important area is none other than Mr. Tom Hardy. Not that one. We have an even better version. Tom is the Professor of Design Management at SCAD University, Savannah College of Art and Design. And previously to joining SCAD, he has led design strategy teams in the, for the likes of Samsung in Korea and IBM in the US. Hi, Tom. Lovely to have you with us today. Before we get stuck into the topic of education, can you tell us a little bit about your history, your work history, and your current role at SCAD? Well, my undergraduate degree was in industrial design uh, from Auburn University. When I graduated, I went to work uh, at IBM as an industrial designer. So after 10 years as an industrial designer, I uh, sold my soul to management, so to speak, and um, got a position in Lexington, Kentucky, one of IBM's locations uh, to build a new design center there. Um, and then my last position at the company was I directed the uh, corporate IBM design program uh, out of corporate headquarters. Uh, so that led me up to uh, what I call the third act in the play of life, and that's uh, teaching. I was an adjunct for them for about five years, and the department grew, and a position came open for full-time design management professor. They asked me would I consider that, and I had really enjoyed my adjunct experience uh, with graduate students. Um, if, you know, graduate students, they ask questions and they also answer questions. And so, and, 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 and I would say most of them want to be there and a lot of them are paying their way there. So it's a kind of a, it's a really wonderful uh, audience to, to work with in the context of academia. So that's where I'm at right now. Fantastic, Tom. Um, I think that because of your history, you're the perfect guest for this episode because we can kind of talk about how technology has changed throughout the years and how you've, from your own perspective, you've seen things kind of develop within the classroom. So I'm looking forward to discussing these areas. But joining Tom today, and for the first time on our show, I'd love to welcome now Jambi Manji, who is uh, MJD's sustainable design strategist. Uh, who's very knowledgeable on the area of education and also previously studied at SCAD. This is quite the reunion. How are you, Jambi? And what are you looking forward to sharing with us with regards to education? Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I'm really happy that I'm sharing this uh, space today with Professor Hardy. It's, it's been great learning from him from SCAD and today sharing our thoughts together. My background was in electronics engineering back in India. And I came to SCAD to study my master's in industrial product design. And along with it, I did my master's in design for sustainability as well. And right now I'm working with MJV as an innovation consultant and taking up a lead into the sustainability strategies. And as a passion, I like to work towards developing more uh, sustainability leaderships. Um, I have experienced uh, working with the local government in Savannah into community resiliency projects, uh, clean energy projects. I've had an opportunity to work with a startup uh, focused on circular fashion tech innovation based in California. And after that, this year, I started working with MGV. Okay, so here at Tech Innovation Talks, we love to start our episodes by talking about future trends. So I'd love to hear from both of you regarding education and some of the trends that we, we, we might be seeing our way soon or, or are already in the classroom. I mean, I went to university in 2003. I'd love to hear how the classroom has changed since I was there. Um, are we still using chalk and floppy disks, disks or have things progressed slightly? Uh, for example, where does remote teaching fit into the current context? Tom, take us behind the scenes of one of your classes at SCAD and, and share with us some of the technology that's being used there, please. 
Okay. SCAD has made some investments in technology over the years, and uh, we have a we have a, a good cross section of applications. Uh, the fundamental infrastructure, if you would, is driven by uh, Blackboard, which is now part of Anthology. So Anthology uh, and Blackboard have merged together, and that brings to Blackboard the capacity for a lot of analytics, which will really be interesting for both faculty and students. They've, they've had an e-learning program for quite a number of years, traditional e-learning, which, as you know, was mostly uh, action, uh, not virtual with the students seeing each other, although periodically one could put together uh, an interactive uh, meeting with the class. But the nature of e-learning is asynchronous. So students from around the world, students who are working uh, that don't have a schedule where they can be in a class on a particular day at a particular time are fundamentally the audience. But aside from posting pictures and post, po posting videos and so forth, there's not really uh, live, if you would, interaction visually between mm -hmm. the students. What came out of COVID was the fact that the campus had to go uh, completely virtual to keep the school operating because the campus was closed down like basically every other campus in the world during that period of time. And so the Zoom process was very successful and it was developed at a point where SCAD decided to eliminate the traditional e-learning uh, process and replace it with what they call SCAD now. And uh, now every class at SCAD is offered either on campus, the traditional live class, if you would, uh, or SCAD now, virtual. For example, you know, if students in China want to, uh, you know, stay up late or early in the morning, uh, as it were, they could do that. And a lot of students actually choose to do that. You know, they, they may have a schedule where they have some flexibility where they can sleep late in the morning. And so they'll stay up and, and attend a virtual class. Tom, um, my two takeaways from that are, are, are kind of the flexibility one that you're, you're, you're covering there, which means that students can kind of study at their own leisure. But if I was to bring you in here, Jambi, I'm kind of thinking that one of the things that might be a bit of a struggle is that lack of face-to-face -face interaction and how that classroom is becoming a, a kind of an online world full of recorded class classes. Um, from your perspective as a recent student, how have you seen things change? And, and what do you make of this kind of lack of maybe one-to-one -one interactions? I feel that's one of the challenging things that people all over the world are still working with, like how to make that online system in a way which um, is collaborative of the same level. Like, you know, like for me, I can say like when I started working and now when I'm moving to different companies and working with MJV as well, I have seen people online, like, you know, on Zoom. I'm still waiting to meet my colleagues in person and start working. So that's yeah. a very different thing. Like, yeah, the debate is always going to be like, it gives you a ton of flexibility because now you can do things in your own time, in your own way. But then you miss out being with the person in the same space. <laughs> yeah, I think as a someone who's recently been looking at a, a couple of courses, um, mm -hmm. that is an area that slightly offers a bit of trepidation and fear to me, Tom. And of course, you can have that one-to-one -one time with a tutor um, online, but I'm not sure if there's a little bit of magic that might be lost by not having those one-to-one -one interactions. Do you have any uh, opinions on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that uh, being together in, in a room, uh, I, the dynamics of all that, I think, are the best way to do this, right? However, what the, vir what the virtual tool has done is that although the students in a physical classroom, you know, will have their their computers on the desk in front of them and they can they can access things and look for re look at references and so forth during a during a, a on ground class. However, I've noticed that during the in the virtual class, they can share the screen instantly with everybody. So it's 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 a uh, much more effective in that regard to pull up different references really quickly 
and share and share their individual screens, and then they're gonna we can have multiple screens with different students' uh, images of their desktop if we're gonna talk to a point. So it's there are some interesting dynamics. You know, you have visual, you can see visually nuances, you know, and how somebody is approaching something. You can do that like we're doing here, the same as you can do in the classroom. But there, there is just, uh, I think, a, you know, the human interaction in a room together is obviously uh, offers a lot of advantages for that. But, but this technology now is really taking us a lot further than it was before. I, I wanted to move the conversation on to data now. And I feel like uh, both of you can kind of answer this in your own way, whichever area you want to touch on. But essentially, with so much data available for universities or, or, or schools to use, I'm wondering uh, what's caught your eye the most. So from my perspective, the thing I was thinking of was kind of the, the security and the data protection. So if everything's online all the time, how do we ensure that sensitive information about students isn't made available and, and how do we protect them and the other thing that caught my attention was more about the actual teaching method so how can we use data to to i don't know um help students who have a specific way of studying things or have a different a specific outlook on things can we be a little bit more scientific in the modern age and use that data to help them study in a certain way you know uh, earlier as you mentioned like you know um it wasn't that evident the way the education system was like it was like one thing fits all kind of a system which now i guess with the use of uh, data and technology combined i would say we can understand like you know any any level of education whether it's professional or primary or you know high school or anything uh, students with special needs or you know people needing a different way everyone like has a different way of learning and grasping things so it can be customized according to how the student needs it or you know which way they learn better whether it is more of interaction learning or the traditional format of learning or you know just say people with dyslexia or any other like you know hearing aid or any any format like that a uh, lot of things can be customized even made a very inclusive setup that you know everyone can be in the same classroom but still have their own needs met so that is very much possible because we have that level of technology and data available at this point of time to differentiate and make it more inclusive as well on the other side uh i appreciate you mentioned that topic about the security because that's a very alarming issue as well how can we make the data secure because you know especially in art and design field you come up with a lot of ideas as a student and you share on, you know, you have your website and you share. And sometimes those ideas are stolen, I would say. Like, wow. you know, and you, you can do nothing, but because you are a student, you only have as much, you know, uh, accessibility to do anything. But this is something to be thought about, I would say, like, how do we make it secure with this? Because this system is now going to be much more as we are seeing, like, you know, virtual learning or virtual working. Yeah, Tom, there's a there's a lot to touch on there. Um, I'd love to get your reaction to the idea of, first of all, of, of, of potentially the protection of the students and the teachers, for that matter. Your, your data is also, you mm. know, uh, being put out there potentially. And also that idea of kind of are these are things being more customized are, are the students who maybe have problems with certain things are there the classes and the way things being taught being more customized from your perspective yes well in terms of security uh scad has a lot of safeguards in place they have filters uh where both student and faculty information can only be accessed by specific people with the right in the administration to do that uh, they filter emails that are coming in. Uh, there's things that they, they'll send directly to uh, spam. And, uh, of course, you know, you, you have the right to go in and check that to see if there was, you know, some error made of the filter, just filtered out something that shouldn't go to spam. But uh, they have a very good program with, with regard to, to security, data security. In terms of the data in the in the classroom environment, that's one of the things I'm excited about and for both faculty and students to have 
access to data, to be able to customize it, to be able to analyze it and get insights and opportunities from all that. I think it's going to be fantastic. Um, one of the things that, that I've uh, been doing with the data is gamifying it. An exercise within the class where they, the whole class, they play a game. And whoever wins the game, whether it, sometimes it would be a team, sometimes it's just in the individual students will compete against each, compete if you would, against each other uh, in certain games. And then the host may give them, you know, some candy or some, no, no cash has ever been involved in this, but um, <laughs> not yet. And, you know, research has shown that gamification of data is retained more effectively than just having talking heads standing up in the front of the room and pontificating about the reading and this is what the author intended and da 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 da. And uh, the students really get engaged in the games. And because when you think about it, the, the students uh, today uh, play a lot of games. They're engaged. You know, they're engaged in that in, in their personal life. And so this, this approach, I think, fits uh, the audience and the technology enables us to do that really easily. Let me, let me kind of switch questions a little bit here and talk to you both about the general standards of education. Uh, there was a report that showed that 58% of employers were not very happy with the, the standards of recent graduates and were complaining about both their oral and written communication. Uh, what do you make of these inefficiencies or, or supposed in the student inefficiencies? What can be done about it? And what do you, what, in general, do you, do you agree with it? I think it depends on a lot of different factors, like especially what kind of companies they are and what kind of graduates they are looking forward for. Like, you know, what's the kind of education you know, level of education they had, like, you know, it's not like a particular sector that they are talking about, right? It's in general, like, at this age and at this stage, um, how do you redefine professionalism is also very important. The way the companies are emerging, for example, the different startups have very different culture now, like, you know, the traditional corporate culture is very different. And also, like, I keep on thinking this, like, you know, uh, from my personal experience, I wouldn't define to scare or go into it but then in my personal experience like i feel i'm blessed having teachers who uh focused on our involvement as a human like as a wholesome education system rather than just focusing upon okay what kind of job you want to have or what kind of employee you want to be they focused on us what kind of leader can we be uh, the expectation from an individual is very different so whatever you do or how much ever professionalism you develop, you would never uh, meet 100% of expectations of the place that you're going to work with or the people you're going to work with. So it's more important, uh, I would say, to think in a way like, you know, for any educational institution, like what kind of individuals are you developing? Yeah, I, th I think that's very interesting about what the, 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 the employer is kind of expecting that's a, an interesting angle to put on it so tom uh you've got to give us your perspective here so far everything's been uh, very pleasant and nice but what's your 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 perspective on the ideas about education potentially not being at the levels that it used to be is this something that you agree with i think in some cases some education programs have been fragmented and split up uh and i think that's probably because in part because of technology and what that's done to industry, how the, how the market has developed, how the, the need for not only hardware, traditional hardware products, but the, you know, a ton of software and applications. And, and so that starts driving different disciplines, be able to develop all, all those different, different diverse materials. I was always, uh, I was brought up in, in design education to look at design as systems thinking, taking a holistic perspective, thinking laterally, not vertically. You know, there, there are certain characteristics that a designer needs to have, human-centered and so forth, uh, uh, to achieve the design of what, what a designer is supposed to be. Now, when the term design thinking we started maybe 10 years or so ago. Some people looked at that as being this new 
way of solving problems? Well, I, I looked at that to, frankly, I was educated to do that. Uh, to me, design thinking is just part of the a process that a, design, a good designer has. Design thinking has been broadened, I think, beyond what the initial intention of that moniker was, because using an approach that a designer uses to solve problems, such as you know, lateral thinking, when to think outside the box, systems, and so forth, uh, would be really valuable to business. MBA programs around the world, you know, from Harvard, Stanford, and so on and so forth, have design thinking types of courses now for MBAs. It's not where MBAs can, they're gonna design a product, you know, or a UX or design or whatever, but it's, it's taking the, the fundamental thinking of process that the designer is trained to do in solving their own business, their own problems, their own business problems. I, I think that that's a good thing because uh, in the sense that it can help the designer in a company where they're always, you know, you're always having to deal with, uh, you, with uh, business disciplines, of course. And, and so in, in many cases, uh, some of the leaders in the company might not understand the value of design, um, but if they have been exposed to it in their education from a business perspective, then it's going to make the designer's job and the design manager's, design manager's role much easier to collaborate because there's empathy between the business discipline and the design discipline. So I've been rambling about <laughs> trying to answer your question, but, I, but it's a it's a complex thing, you know. Sure. And um, but all in all, I, I think design's in a good place now. One of the things at MJV is that we've recently put together a, a report, uh, an ebook on on uh, education and, and technology and innovation in technology in education, and we'll make that that ebook available in the link to this, oh. this video. But one of the things that, that kind of came up when we were doing our research is the fact that with these kind of criticisms that are coming, there's also a lot of pressure on teachers and there's this kind of teacher crisis, which has developed with lots of more than 48% of teachers admitting that they would considered quitting during the pandemic, but there is a, a, a challenge now for teachers and, and there's there's a shortage of teachers. Jambi, I was thinking from your perspective and Tom afterwards, um, what can be done about this? How can we protect our teachers, which are so crucial? Uh, what can we do from an innovation perspective? I think it goes back to the kind of expectations we have. At mm -hmm. times we think like, okay, whatever new technology is coming up, a teacher should be well-versed with everything. Like, you know, a teacher cannot be a superhero. Let's keep it that way. Like, you know, uh, every professor has their own expertise, their own experiences and the strengths that we can say. And so goes to the students as well. Like, you know, every student has different level of strengths and, you know, uh, one system fits all the more we try to do that the more complicated it's going to get like you know uh, even when it comes to the corporates it's the same thing like you know you cannot expect one employee to know everything or you know or to make them siloed in just certain aspects like you know just for certain technology we want one person and you know one person just doing this thing so that's something i guess if we look from a holistic perspective that has to change and especially with you know even uh going everything online or the virtual system not the teachers before us have never used that system right it's it's new for even them to adapt so we can't just magically think that okay everything should work out or things should be like that so it made me go back and think about okay what kind of student teacher relationships are we looking forward here for like you know what kind of uh, teaching systems when you talk about you know teaching or um, professional development like how are you looking up to it matters a lot like if you are looking from a systems perspective or if you are looking holistically to that you'll be thinking about the overall development of an individual itself like you know the way of thinking of a person in terms of design if you see a designer is not just someone who understands okay this is the different design formats or this is how you are going to implement 
the kind of person he or she is is what is going to reflect in the kind of solutions they bring up yeah yeah and i'm thinking a lot about the financial aspect of things as well i, I remember i was lucky enough to be in the uk at the time education at universities was free and i was lucky enough to be one of the last people hmm. to have that possibility now that's changed and in the uk for example there's a lot of more pressure on the teachers because parents uh, and and or family members might be spending thousands and thousands of pounds and dollars or whatever it is to get their, their their kids through education so there's a lot more pressure there what i'm thinking specifically about tom here is what can institutions whether it be universities or or or, or even schools do to kind of protect the teachers well i don't know if this is creating a boundary as it is uh ensuring that there's flexibility because i think that uh, teachers need to be op open and have flexibility that things are going to change and don't get stuck in the same routine if you've been teaching a certain way uh again that goes back to lateral thinking right don't get stuck in it i think somebody at, at uh, stanford said faculty uh today uh, they don't need to be the sage on the stage. They need to be the guide on the side. And I think that's very good because students today get exposed to virtually everything and they know where they know where to find it. Uh, there's so many times that I've may have said something in a classroom, you know, and all of a sudden I see the students, they're going and they're trying to find out if this is true. <laughs> what I said. So they'll look. They'll look up. For, they'll look up a reference, and they may. And then, or they. They may not just try to see if it's true, but uh, verify it. all the time. Verify. It. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but they'll come up with another related example, and so that can happen instantly. Whereas without that technology and the tools sitting in front of you, you couldn't do that in a classroom traditional classroom, you'd have to go to the library and go through all the books and try to figure something out and then run back. I mean, you know, that took a lot of time. But today it's just it's instant, instant information access, which I think is fantastic. So you have to deal with that and have to be open enough to do it. And so, you know, the uh, guide on the side, not the sage on the stage, doesn't mean that you just let everybody go off and do what they want to do. But in my view, the way to handle that is you give you give students uh, the background and the right information and, and the right process to approach a problem, fundamental process, and then get, make sure they understand the problem statement clearly and then back off and let them do it and, and observe it. I mean, you have to be a sage to have enough experience to be able to understand when they're starting to veer off in another direction that might not be going the way they should be going. Uh, and then kind of nudge them back a little bit and then back off again. I mean, that's just a constant process, right? But th and then there's some times where you have to understand when it should go outside the box. Sometimes you should let them do that. Uh, don't just stay within the boundary, but you know, uh, that's the way innovation happens. I mean, a lot of times innovation happens more out of desperation than inspiration. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, if you don't have tension, you can't have progress. And so you want to, you still want to let it go to where there is tension. It's not just, you, you just want a safe process because we've always done it this way. So you need to go at one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, and that's how you measure the students. You purposely want to let it go sometimes, but you know, but you have to, you ha do have to have that sage uh, knowledge and an overview to be able to know when it may be on totally off the rails in, in the context of an education environment and an assignment and what you got to do in a certain period of time. All those constraints to be able to pull it back. Tom, I, I it's funny because I, I expected you to to come out in defense of the teachers. Like what I was expecting from you was a kind of like, oh, what we need is a this, this, and this, but essentially what I'm hearing and, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is you're saying that no, actually it's a more demanding job. Maybe some of the teachers back in the day were, were getting away with things where 
they weren't getting fact checked and and now the standards have just gone up and 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 maybe that's uh, what we can do to support them with my kind of institutional hat on is the training needs to be better for the teachers they need to be in that classroom better prepared like uh, growing up we always learn like the best teacher is the one who never teaches and it's the mm. same thing like uh, we are at the age where you know a generation where we don't need any spoon feeding to be done like as professor said that you know everything is so available on the internet like tons of things are available you tell a topic and we figure out okay what is relevant how things are going to be done even before uh, we take a class like you know when we get the curriculum we sit and uh, you know uh, look up things uh, for it like you know what's happening what's going to happen how we can use this how people are actually working in industry using this term so just you put design thinking and you get tons of materials on it right you just put data analysis you'll get tons of materials on it so in this scenario the way we actually need a teacher is a mentor a guide who can shape that direction for us right you know who can sometimes make things tougher for us so that we grow into that scenario or make like we need a professor or a teacher as a director uh you can, we can see that as a director of a movie who sets the entire scenario up who prepares you to uh you know explains you okay this is how things need to be done or this is how you know you can be and then let the actors take up the stage and let them be and then directs them as and how required so that's how i think like you know even for the in, in terms of teachers like traditionally uh, there is we still see uh, teachers like that who are very uh, you know adamant or who are stuck to their way of teaching or who still thinks that okay we know everything we are right but then at times we need that level of flexibility and also that level of emotional intelligence when a professor is okay to say that okay we don't know everything but we can grow together well, that just about does it for now. As usual, I'd like to thank both of our guests. First up, Jambi, thanks for your insights. And Tom, thanks for being a marvelous guest. But before I sign off in traditional fashion, I'd like to draw your attention to our brand new ebook on the very subject of education, which of course will be made available in the description of this video. But that's all for now. Don't forget to give us that all important like, share and comment. But until next time, keep innovating.